Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, so this is the title of my talk, uh, and it's going to be a challenge in uh, 10 to 12 minutes to uh, explain a clinical uh, problem in diabetes, but I'm going to do my best. And to do that, I'm going to give, tell you a bit about the studies which have looked at intensive glucose lowering and cardiovascular outcomes uh, and show how hypoglycemia is potentially relevant and how we've been doing studies to explore. So this is a forest plot taken from a meta-analysis published in The Lancet some years ago. Uh, and, and the uh, first trial, which you can see here, is uh, a very well-known trial called the UK Prospective Diabetes Study. It was a trial in people with type 2 diabetes, as you can see, it involved around uh, 3,500 individuals. And it was the first trial which proved that intensive glucose control could prevent uh, what we call microvascular complications, complications affecting the eyes, feet, and kidneys. Now, that was well known in type 1. It had never been proven in type 2. But interestingly, as shown on this slide, you can see that there was a trend towards uh, reduced or caused mortality. Um, it wasn't statistically significant, although interesting, a long-term follow-up. This was a 10-year trial. After 20 years, there was a significant uh, reduction. Uh, and so the hypothesis was that if we could get glucose really low, uh, then we would prove that glucose control could reduce uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, now, this trial was in newly diagnosed individuals. Uh, it was probably underpowered uh, to show this. So as a result of this, there were three large trials which were then conducted to test just this hypothesis. This is the advanced trial, and you can see that in this trial, um, there were around uh, 11,000 individuals. So it was well-powered to test uh, the hypothesis. It was a five-year trial. I was actually involved with this trial. And you'll see that although the trend was in the same direction, it clearly wasn't significant confidence intervals across the line of unity. A smaller trial in American vets went the opposite direction, wide confidence intervals, low numbers. But it was the ACCORD trial, which as you can see, showed an increase in mortality, which is exactly the opposite of what was expected, and actually resulted in a premature termination of the trial, which really startled the diabetes community. We weren't really expecting this, uh, and clearly it showed that tight glucose control, aggressive treatment wasn't necessarily a good thing. So overall, there was no uh, benefit in uh, terms of cardiovascular disease, and the question was why were these three trials showing this? It could have been chance, it could have been weight gain, because if intensive insulin therapy in type 2 diabetes will cause you to gain weight. But this slide shows severe hypoglycemia in the three trials. We define severe hypoglycemia uh, as being cognitively impaired, sufficient to need the help of another person. So well-defined and measured uh, accurately in the trials. You'll note that advance on the right-hand side shows actually very low rates of severe hypoglycemia. You'll remember that went in the direction of potential benefit. But you'll also see that the cord had much higher rates of hypoglycemia. So the hypothesis that we and others have advanced is could it be that the bad effects of hypoglycemia on the cardiovascular system were overcoming uh, the potential benefits. Now, in trying to understand this, it's a very controversial thing because the other explanation was that if you have a hypoglycemic event and you're frail, you have comorbidities, you're perhaps more likely uh, to have mortality, but it's not clearly not a causal connection, and we call this confounding. And so ever since the publication of this trial, uh, we, uh, as investigators, have been trying to divvy this up. We can't do a randomized controlled trial. It's clearly not ethical to induce severe hypoglycemia. So we have to do the best that we can with observational studies. And one such study was published in the uh, BMJ some years ago. And you can see they looked at nearly an, a million participants who were being controlled. Uh, and although they found this strong association, they also did a statistical technique which they call bias analysis and came to the conclusion that there weren't sufficient comorbidities to explain the association uh, and therefore concluded there was indeed an association 
and they considered this a risk factor and not a risk marker. And one of the reasons that they came to this conclusion is that they point out that there are a series of plausible mechanisms by whereby hyperglycemia might uh, worsen cardiovascular disease. I'm going to show you data shortly on platelet activation and thickness of blood clot. So uh, hyperglycemia increases coagulation abnormalities. It causes low-grade inflammation, uh, endothelial dysfunction, and of course, the sympathoadrenal response, which happens during hyperglycemia with an increase in circulating adrenaline, uh, will increase myocardial oxygen demand and, and could precipitate angina or even myocardial infarction. And it's connected with rhythm abnormalities, uh, as, uh, as I'll show you. Now, one of the issues uh, when you're doing these studies is that the association is not at the time. And by that, I mean that the severe hypoglycemic event predicts mortality sometimes up to one year later. So when you're studying this, you have to try and address the downstream consequences. So these data are taken uh, from uh, a PhD, which Elaine Chow, a very gifted PhD student in our group, um, uh, undertook. And, and what she did was to take individuals with type 2 diabetes uh, and took them to the laboratory and clamped them. She kept their glucose at two different levels, normal glucose at uh, around 5.5 uh, millimoles per liter. Uh, and on another occasion, she brought them back and lowered their glucose to 2.5, which is fairly moderate hypoglycemia, far less actually than you'll see in clinical practice. Um, and you can see that the two are different. The orange shows the clamp, the duration of the two hour clamp, and then she brought the patients back a day and a week later. So she looked at clot maximum absorbance, and you'll see at the end of the two hours of hypoglycemia compared to euglycemia, there's no significant difference. But a week later, she's now seeing uh, increases in the thickness of blood clot. She also shows um, that clot lysis, the time taken for her, the blood to dissolve the blood clot, uh, is uh, different and way worse during hypoglycemia compared to euglycemia. She shows an acute phase protein response, not at the time of hypoglycemia. If we concluded the experiment, then we'd have said there's no difference, but you'll see uh, seven days later, there's a marked increase in fibrinogen and importantly, uh, CRP. Uh, and as many of you know, uh, low-grade inflammation is a powerful uh, precipitant uh, of atherosclerosis. So here's uh, evidence that hypoglycemia, which is not severe, this is hypoglycemia that happens every day in people that is potentially possible. Now we're also interested in arrhythmias and there are a number of case reports showing a variety of cardiac arrhythmias which can be precipitated by hypoglycemia. So Elaine went on to do a really quite simple study. She took 25 individuals with increased risk of cardiovascular disease and type two diabetes and she simply put an ambulatory electrocardiogram and a continuous glucose monitor, which are now available actually for clinical use, uh, and, just, and looked uh, to see what would happen. What she found is that each instance of untreated patients, many of them had hypoglycemia at night, um, and these episodes were asymptomatic. And then she then measured an incident rate ratio. Um, by con we controlled for circadian rhythm and measured periods of hypoglycemia against euglycemia in the same person. And you can see here that we didn't show any increase in ventricular uh, ectopics, um, uh, at least complex ones. We did show uh, a significant increase in atrial ectopics. Uh, but most interesting of all was an eightfold increase in bradycardia. Now you'll notice that the in confidence intervals are very wide, although they don't cross unity, so it's statistically significant. But the point was that only four out of the 25 individuals had this bradycardia. So this is idiosyncratic. Here's an example of one patient. This is a known patient with ischemic heart disease and asymptomatic at night. They're having these cardiac arrhythmias, a heart rate of 35 beats per minute with trigeminy, something which in a healthy individual may be okay, but in somebody with narrow coronary arteries might not be so good. She also took a group of patients with type 2 diabetes and compared them to non-diabetic individuals uh, and measured various measures of cardiac repolarization, uh, and uh, she measured the T wave. This is the part of the electrocardiogram which is concerned with repolarization. 
Uh, and this is a rate independent measure which can predict arrhythmias in other conditions. You'll notice if when we compare euglycemia and hypoglycemia on the right, there's really no difference. But when you look at the diabetic patients on the left during hypoglycemia uh, in red, then there's a move for the T wave to become more symmetric, a reta ratio of one, and that is indeed uh, what predicts arrhythmias. So differences between type two uh, individuals and non-diabetic subjects, and that reads statistical significance. Finally, for those of you who don't think that hypoglycemia kills, this is a slide, a rather startling and sad slide, uh, of an individual with type one diabetes on the day that he died and he died of hypoglycemia. What you can see here is a glucose trace put on him by his uh, physician because he'd had a hypoglycemic fit, fit the year before. He's age 23, he's using ins insulin pump, which is the best way of delivering insulin. You can see that his glucose is very high. 250 milligrams um, is around 12, 13 millimoles per liter. You see his glucose falls during the day, he exercises, um, he gets his carbohydrate wrong, his sugar goes up to around 300 uh, again, and then he stacks his insulin in purple. You can see him giving five doses of insulin because his glucose remains high. That is a disaster. It's what we teach our patients not to do. He goes to bed, his glucose drops to very low levels, around two millimoles per liter, and during the night he dies. Autopsy, there's absolutely nothing to find, no brain damage, for example. He died an arrhythmic death. So in conclusion, I've shown you that experimental hypoglycemia has lasting effects on hemorrheology and markers inflammation uh, in experimental studies, that asymptomatic nocturnal hypoglycemia is common, prolonged, and associated with arrhythmias, um, that experimental hypoglycemia causes abnormal cardiac repolarization, particularly in people with diabetes. So, how might uh, Insignio help us? Well, we could do computer analysis of large data sets, um, plus in silico modeling of cardiac action potentials to understand this clinical importance of this condition. I conclude by saying that I do think patients with both type 2 and type, di di uh, type 1 diabetes are at uh, increased risk. I acknowledge the many people who've worked with us, including our funders, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you, Simon. Splendid. Um, sorry, it probably is a naive question. You know, I don't work in this area. Do we have a clear um, pathophysiology? mechanistic understanding of the relationship between uh, hypoglycemia and cardiac function. I mean, do we know the chain of events that link one to the other? We do to some extent, um, but quite what the precise mechanism is, I don't know. We can clearly show low-grade inflammation, and of course, tight glucose control reduces inflammation. We know that high glucose does that as well. So it may be that the two are just working against each other. In terms of arrhythmias, there is clear evidence that hypoglycemia, particularly induced with insulin, can, for example, reduce serum potassium. That can cause prolonged uh, abnormal cardiac repolarization. We also know that hypoglycemia directly can affect some of the ion channels which subserve the cardiac action potential. So we know the mechanisms. We can't prove causality. We never will be able to. I don't think. So the best I think we can do is do mechanistic studies uh, and in large numbers of patients perhaps look for arrhythmias um, and, and if we can model this we may be get, able to understand how we might prevent it. That sounds a great talk. Um, if the death rates are different between intensive and non-intensive glucose control, is there a difference in why people die in those groups? according to the difference. Uh, the theory. problem is that we don't. I mean, if hypoglycemia killed you at the time, as I'd shown in that patient with type 1 diabetes, then clearly the relationship is obvious. The other problem is that we measure severe hypoglycemia because it's easy to measure. If somebody goes unconscious uh, in a trial, you just tick that off. Uh, but 
um, we haven't been able to demonstrate a direct cause. You know, the likelihood somebody crashes their car because their hypoglycemia is very little. Um, but we, of course, we know that hypoglycemia is doing this. We do know that hypoglycemia predicts mortality. So those who've had at least one episode have a much higher risk of dying. What we don't know is exactly what it's due to. So um, the problem is we don't measure the right hypoglycemia in trials because it's so difficult. And so looking for the direct link is never going to be possible as, as on uh, randomized controlled trials. You clearly can't randomize somebody to have more hypoglycemia. Your ethics committee wouldn't like it. Thank you. Thank you.